you join me today at the wheel of one of the ultimate 80s icons of motoring. Yes, I'm in an E30, but not the big engine 325. I'm in the baby 316. Proud to be sponsored by Diamond Bright, the car care products that have been keeping the furious fleet looking their best for a long time already. To find all you need to keep your car clean and protected, follow the link below to diamondbright.co.uk. Weren't the 80s brilliant? If you remember the 80s, you were probably there playing on a Nintendo. It was a great time and design was amazing and so exciting at the time, even though looking at cars of the era, they are a little bit boxy, but boxy in the best way possible. Which brings us immediately to this, the BMW E30, possibly the most BMW-ish BMW that there ever was. And it's quite amazing to think this actually was released in 1982. That's 38 years ago. I'm aghast and possibly even agog at that. What I'm even more agog about is that work on this car began as far back as 1976. I can't believe this is a 70s car. And that was under chief designer Klaus Luth. But a lot of the actual styling work was done by a guy called Boyk Boyer, and I'm sure I said that wrong. Styling was signed off in 1978, and there we have it. It was set in stone, and that was the car we then have. Now visually, it owes a lot to the previous E21. That was the first generation 3 Series. This is the second generation, of course. But under the skin, it is a totally different car. And looking back at promotional material from the time, there's all kinds of videos of crash testing, computer-aided design work, all kinds of under the skin work, which make it an entirely new generation of car, not even any way related to the previous E21. Now, obviously, like a lot of BMWs of the age, for all BMWs of that age, it is a front hinge bonnet. So we have lovely easy access from the sides, but leaning in the front is a bit tricky for servicing. Now this is a 316i. Now when the E30 was launched, they carried over a lot of the engines from the previous E21. In particular, the M10 and the M20, four and six cylinder petrol engines. Now when the 316 came out, it had the M10, but not a 1.6, a 1.8, but a carburetor fed one, which meant they only made 89 horsepower and 104 newton meters of torque. When the car got a major facelift in 1987, the car got an actual 1.6 litre, this time an M40 with Bosch L-Tronic fuel injection. And despite being a smaller engine, it made more power. It was now making 95 horsepower and 107 newton meters of torque. Now this front end is one of the iconic car faces, not just of the 80s, but of any era. And this and the other cars of this generation, the 7 Series, the 5 Series, all came around in the mid 80s, just cemented the idea in the public psyche of what a BMW should look like. The kidney grille was already kind of set in stone, um, but the twin headlights kind of became BMW's thing. And it's only really now that they don't veered away from it. Being a 1.6, it's fairly low in the range, so it doesn't get the fog lights that the 320 and up would get as standard. It kind of goes without saying that the current generation, the new M4 in particular, really have kind of lost their way when it comes to styling. When you look at something like this, so restrained, so elegant, summing up the brand perfectly, and the new one is just... Another thing which has been kind of controversially left out of the latest BMW design is this little area here, the Hofmeister kink, where the window come, comes back on itself. It's been a stalwart of BMW design since the 70s, and it really does mark out the side profile view of a BMW. Obviously it features here, you can find E30 in the car park just from that little view just there quite easily. Now the E30 didn't really change much throughout its entire life cycle. There was a minor update in 1984 and then a proper update giving the Series 2 in 1987. The E30 didn't really change throughout its entire production run. There was a minor update in 1984 and a more significant one in 1987 and they call that the Series 2. Um, there were, again weren't big changes, mostly it was the tail lights, less chrome trim and better rust proofing. And you can tell this is probably a Series 2 car by the condition of the bodywork and the tail lights and the trim. Oh. The interior E30s was always their strongest and their weakest point. It's a great design, lovely layout, and most of the materials are really tough and solid and strong. However, the driver's seat fabric was always, or just always, so fragile that sort of come when they're about 10, 15 years old, it was not uncommon to see a completely frayed through to the sponge driver's seats on these cars with like only 100,000 miles on them. This one, however, is an astonishing survivor with only 51,000 miles on it. And the interior is virtually like new. The only thing we've got different in this car is the steering wheel is non-standard and the radio is still a blow punked, but it's a later one. Oh, 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 this is exciting. It's a side entry cassette player. Oh, wow. Now let's look around the interior. The doors are astonishingly simple. There's not much going on there at all. You've only got about two or three items of furniture on there. The design, obviously simple as well. Uh, all very straight edge, linear, front to back, 
The door card's made of like a plasticky vinyl material with a bit of padding behind it. And it looks like stitching in these long horizontal stripes, but it's actually all just pressed in molding. In terms of other stuff on the door, you've got the smallest little plastic door handle ever. Right back here, it's actually quite a long way to reach your arm back to find it. And it sounds like a Spitfire going over right now. It is, it's a Spitfire. So yes, we've got a door handle very far back and we've got a big grab handle, which is actually perfectly placed and very solid, a tiny, tiny bit squishy, but barely. And in the top of that, looking like a, like a fighter pilot's uh, machine gun, is your mirror adjustment doodle with a little left, right, uppy, downy rocker in front of it. Below that, it's just a big cutout, so there's room for the seat and a fairly narrow, but quite deep door pocket, just the right size for losing a phone or a wallet in or dropping keys in there and never find them again. That is a door, there's nothing else on there, no, no other electrical switches and anything else at all. Very simple indeed. We do have a nice blue tinted door mirror though, that looks very posh. Now the dashboard. This is again, like the outside of the car, quite angular, quite square, like the door card, it's quite, uh, quite linear and angular. So hiding the dials, we've got this kind of trapezoidal, it looks like a building out of Blade Runner, this little cowl over the dials. And they're quite big, bold dials, very easy to read, uh, going up to about 150 miles an hour on the speedo on the left-hand side, and the uh, rev counter going up to, what, 7,000, redlining at 6,000. So this little four-cylinder would be absolutely screaming by the time they got there. And of course, we've also got that wonderful old BMW reverse swingometer for the economy. Right now it's turned off, so it's showing infinite above 60, but we'll go down to the single digits if you really hoof the car. Uh, left and right we've got fuel gauge and uh, temperature gauge and little individual circles and below that a nice clean line of light up dials and interestingly they're not kind of black when the ignition's turned off they've all got little white icons that you can see permanently all the time when the engine's turned off and everything and uh, they just light up behind them so you turn the ignition on and you get little red lights behind the parking brake the brakes the ignition everything like that and if you turn the fog lights on then you get the little warning lights behind that and of course we also have the little green leds going up to yellow and red for service indicator lights which is a lovely idea from the 80s before there's like proper digital readouts and computers and things, you've got this little LED strip which looked so futuristic in 1982. If you had a Spectrum at home, or a ZX81, this was amazing. Then we have the Storks. They are quite curious. They're a bit like the 7 Series E32 I drove not so long ago, in that the, uh, the main stalk as it comes out of the column is just a little twisted bit of metal, painted black and very discreet so that the plastic end almost just hovers in mid-air. Indicators and main beams on the left, and wipers on the right, so they're quite angular, angular, not anglia, that's a different thing entirely, uh, like the rest of the interior and the exterior, just lots of squares and angles going on all over the place. Down to the right of the wheel, got a little pull-out knob, which is for your side lights and dip beam lights, and with the light switch pulled all the way out, you can push the button to the left of it to get your rear fogs on. This car's got no front fogs, so obviously nothing happens with that. Interestingly, the little symbols above these uh, switches are so faint, you can barely see them at all, but once the rear fogs are on, you do get a little orange indicator warning light telltale up here on the dashboard. So you know it's happened. And finally down here on the right, right down by your foot, you have the levelling for the headlights if you've got heavy loads tucked away in the boot. Now moving to the left, uh, there are no cup holders in this car because BMW hate people drinking liquid of any form, um, but we do have a big massive T-shelf square in the middle and it's quite tall so I didn't bring a cup because no cup holders, but you could put many many cups, steins even, on top of here and with this large recessed area on top of the dashboard divided into three areas. So if you're having some kind of uh, buffet situation going on, you could put sweet, savoury, volivons, all kinds of stuff in these little areas up here. I would actually recommend keeping in the farthest area to the left, which is quite small, just for, for dips. In the main central area of the dashboard, the console, if you will, we have two very, very big uh, air vents blowing lots of air to you if you want it to, or can be turned off, so they don't blow air onto you. Your choice. Then, moving down, this big square clock, this is the same big square clock I think I saw in the E32 7 series, which at the time I thought would look a little bit out of place because it looked a lot like a Vauxhall clock. It hasn't changed in this car, um, but it does tell the time surprisingly accurately. Then over to the right of that, carrying on back towards yourself, got the hazard warning lights, which are big and illuminated when you're flashing them on and off. Rear screen heater. This car has got a Clifford alarm system fitted. I guess that was fitted in the 80s because I don't know if they're still around even. Um, and then we've got this wonderful Blaupunkt Bremen SQR 
got a dab on it. This is a modern radio, but it looks like an old one. Oh, I like this. I'm going to have to investigate this for my Mercedes. Um, <laughs> I'm going off kilter here. I'm going to find out where this came from. And it looks like a sideways cassette entry, but it's not. It's got USB, aux input, and SD card. Oh, I want one of these quite a lot now. This is exciting. There is actually an iPhone lead underneath the dashboard as well, so this has got full modern car integration, which is very exciting, but looks very old. Brilliant, I like this. Now underneath we've got the heating and ventilation control. This car has not got air conditioning. There's a big blanked off area, so if you're lucky enough to have air conditioning, that's where it would be. But it's uh, quite a nice bit of design. It makes a break from the usual just three matching dials because we've got a dial on the left for temperature, dial on the right for fan speed, and then a stack of three sliders choosing for face, body and feet where you want the air to go. It's quite a nice bit of different design. That's a BMW being a bit exciting and different, which is good. And below that, we've got a big cubby hole, lots of space there, and a big ashtray because it's the 80s, so big ashtray, and a 12 volt socket next to it so you can plug your iPhone sat nav in in the modern world. Now, we come back to more controls. First of all, let's talk about the uh, windows. This being a coupe, only two sets of switches. If it was a four-door, all four would be here as well. But not being rocker switches or anything like that, it's two individual buttons per door. Window goes down, window goes up. Window goes down, window goes up. And this always amuses me on a coupe. I've got a window lockout for the passenger. Just sitting right there, you can just say, don't touch the thing, but no, no, there's a button for that. Um, and this car, though, isn't automatic, so this will be the four-speed ZF in this particular car. A very short, stubby lever, like a big kind of tea thing, like an aircraft. Again, we've got more aircraft stuff, but this is a jet age throttle thingy for your park into reverse neutral prindle. You've also got lock-ins for three, two, and one as well, so you can lock the ge gears for whatever you want. Manual handbrake, of course, and a little tray back here for more cubbiness. And looking up above, we've got a manual sunroof. Wow, look at this. A cranky handle, tilt slide, sunroof. Oh, how cool is that? So you can have it all the way back for sunshine, flooding in, shut for when it's raining, or just cracked open a little way for, uh, for getting a bit of breeze in. Oh, that's great. I like a proper old school sunroof like that. Nice little sun visors. Uh, this one's got a DAB aerial hidden in it. <laughs> And then that's it. The seats aren't overwhelmingly supportive. They're quite comfortable. There's this nice kind of thick tweedy material, which looks like it's hardware or thing in the world, but we know for a fact isn't. But in this lovely blue color, looks so cool with the blue door cards and the blue carpets. What a nice interior to be in. Let's have a quick look in the back and then the boot, and we'll take it for a drive. Now, to access the back of the car, there's a big lever on the side of the front seats, which also doubles as quite a handy kind of catch to leave your seatbelt resting against to make it easy to grab hold of. Um, Getting into the back is relatively easy because not only does the seat back fold forward, the entire base pivots forward as well, so you've got lots of access, making climbing in quite easy. Now once you're in with the seat folded back, you've got decent foot room. There's a bit tight on your toes, but good knee room because the front seats have got a big recess kind of moulded into the plastic back of the front seat. Um, you've got nice shoulder width, that's okay if there's only two of you. There are three seat belts across here, um, and the seat is this same lovely blue tweedy stuff which is all squishy and soft and the padding is nice and you sink quite deeply into it but even so there's not much in the way of headroom and uh, this is a car with good headlining it's not drooping or anything but still my head is touching the ceiling you don't have much in the way of amenities back here a padded armrest molded into the side of the uh, the door panel well the side panel and you've got the same horizontal stripes kind of molded in carrying on from the front door uh, you've got grab handle left and right and a little coat hook at the top of each b post along with a courtesy light. There's a little ashtray here in the center and the, behind the handbrake. And you've got speakers, rear speakers in the uh, parcel shelf. So a total of four speakers in the car. But that really is kind of it. There's no other amenities back here for your rear seat passengers. No extra lights, no extra, well, anything really. Not, not, even, not even map pockets on the back of the chairs. But this is more about the driver, not the back seat passengers in this car. Now, the trunkle area is as boxy and square as the rest of the car. The um, boot lid folds only just a little way down over the back of the car just to meet the top of the lights. That does mean the lip is astonishingly high. It's basically waist high. And this is not a car I would recommend to would-be gangsters because if you're trying to haul a body into the back of this car, it's very, very hard indeed. Um, and getting them out again as well is even harder because trying to get hold of things, oh, let's say sacks of potatoes, not, not, not victims, um, would be very difficult indeed to get over this lip inconspicuously, you're going to draw attention to yourself doing this. Once stuff is in here, um, it is very, very deep. It goes way, way back in there. So you could put a lot of 
items in there. But the thing is, they would need to be either kind of small and, or flexible or squishy in some way because big square sort of suitcases and stuff don't really want to go around this, this angle very well. What you need for that really is the touring. Mm. E30 Tourings are nice. Now in the back of here we've got a lot of original equipment. We've got BMW uh, warning triangle with BMW uh, first aid kit. All in this drop down cubby area on the right. On the left is another kind of drop down cubby area. It's got the jack, the wheel brace, that kind of stuff. And up in the top we've also got the famous, everyone loves these things, the BMW toolkit complete with all the spanners and everything. All whoops, BMW badged, fantastic. Under the carpet, we've got a full-size steel wheel, because this car's got steel wheels. If it was an alloy wheel car, I think it would have an alloy with it. Now, as I mentioned, this is an automatic, and my preference would always be for a manual, but you know, this is a nice car, so I'm not gonna complain today. Um, now, originally, when this car came out in pre-facelift, the 316 and the 318, this would have been a three-speed ZF, but post-facelift, like this car is, that would be a four-speed ZF, so a little bit more modern. On the manual side, the 316 and 318 before facelift would have been the uh, four-speed jet drag, get drag. And after facelift, they got a five-speed manual. There were two other gearboxes used as well for the bigger powered uh, regular three series, the 323, 325 and so on. They got the jet drag or get drag 260 and the M3 got the 265. But that had the dog leg first. Now the thing I really remember about driving these cars is the steering lock. Everyone always goes on about how long the steering lock is. It's only actually four turns fully lock to lock, but people say you should definitely change it for the M3 lock. But it turns out that's only three and a half turns lock to lock, so there's not really a lot in it. And in most driving, you're not really gonna notice a difference. And certainly on a 316, you're not gonna notice a difference a great deal either. My own personal experience of nearly coming a cropper on these is when I had an Alpha 156, which has got about two turns lock to lock and an E30 at the same time. And hitting the same corner, forgetting what car you were driving, could get a little awkward. Now, probably the most common variant of this car would be the 320. That was the one that pretty much everyone bought. It was a nice middle of the road, about 120 horsepower. But of course, the one that everyone wants now is a 325. But there's almost none of those left now because they've been just snapped up by people doing racing, drifting, that kind of stuff. And so now we're coming to the point where most of the good cars that are left seem to be the smaller engine cars, the 316s, the 318s, the automatics, where they weren't so desirable for the racing and they were cared for by people who bought them new, weren't gonna drive them hard in the first place. And so the cars have just lasted and lasted and been really well sort of cared for all their lives. But this one just looks immaculate. It's like a brand new car virtually. Now, this might not have the 168 horsepower of the 325, but it does have the same amazing chassis, and that's why these things became so popular. This was the yuppie generation, aspirational driver's car. Everyone wanted to have a good looking, exciting, interesting car, drove an E30. So it still gets the same McPherson struts in the front. It gets the same trailing arms in the rear. There was a bit of an accusation of a bit of tuck under at certain extreme handling situations, but for the most part, it's a very rewarding, engaging chassis to drive. The corners brilliantly and has wonderful road holding. Mostly, they are disc brakes all around as well, so they've got very good stopping power too. Some of the smaller engines, the 316s in particular, did have drums on the back. So for the most part, discs all around. ABS became an option in 1986 though. Even with the smallest engine in the lineup, this is still quite a reasonable performer. We're going up about one in three hill at the moment, and the car is quite happy to pull. This might not have the same bark and growl as the straight six, but it's a lovely smooth engine in this little four cylinder. It's quite a nice thing to drive behind really. Like all E30s, you've got the floor hinged accelerator pedal, which takes a little bit of getting used to. Of course, it's got the regular hanging down brake pedal like everything else in the world. And the steering is quite heavy, even though it's power assisted, it has a feeling that maybe it almost isn't. There's not much assistance going on. And it's actually improved in this car because a big criticism of part of the reason people consider the lock to lock being so bad is because it's got a very big steering wheel as standard. This has got a little bit of a smaller wheel on it, which actually helps it, makes it feel a bit more direct than it would normally. 
But once you get up to about 50 miles an hour or 60 miles an hour, it's lovely and smooth. The thing just kind of floats along. It's surprising how soft and compliant the suspension is considering that it's considered a real driver's car. Pitching hard into a roundabout, it does lean a little bit, but it grips rather well. So it leans a lot, I should say. It leans a lot. <laughs> Now this car may well have been the epitome of 80s style, and it was literally everywhere. It was in the background of TV and film, it was outside every bank and every bistro and wine bar, which was the thing back then. And it's not surprising really when you consider they made 2.43 million of these, which is quite a lot. And nearly all those cars came out of Germany from um, Munich and Regensburg, with a few more being churned out from South Africa in uh, Roslin. Of course, there was even more for the Far East. They were built knockdown kits, complete knockdown kits where the cars send in uh, half built form to Thailand, to Bangkok and Jakarta. So it's, it's almost distracting, like when Sat Labs first came out, watching that little mileometer, mile per gallonometer thing. It's like the sort of swinging needle, you put your foot down and suddenly it just goes down while the revs go up. Oh, 20, no, it's like 12 to the gallon men accelerating. Oh, that's not good. In normal driving, this thing actually gets about 35 to the gallon, which is pretty respectable for like a 30-year-old retro daily. There is a certain smell when you open the door of one of these. It's a little bit covered by the air freshener in here, but you open the door of an 80s BMW, you can smell the 1980s. I'm not sure what particular part of the car it is, but it's a little kind of a, a dry, sweet smell. It's still a bit similar in the current Mercedes, or at least the previous generation Mercedes. It still smell a little bit the same, but ger but BMWs are a little bit of their own scent, their own odour. It's interesting. It's quite nice, actually. And driving this car does kind of bring back memories. I really do miss mine. I wish I'd not sold it. It's one of those stupid things. I thought I'd get a bit of money for it and get a better one, but I wound up with like the dog looking at his reflection with the bone, getting nothing at all. This has brought it all back, and now I want another E30. I hope you've enjoyed this ride out today in the Baby Beamer. If you have, please hit like, please hit subscribe, uh, share on Facebook and all that kind of stuff, and I'll see you again driving something completely different.